It's the 5th of May and you're listening to Kopi Time, a podcast on economies and markets by DBS Group Research here in Singapore. I'm Taimur Beg, Chief Economist. Welcome to our 11th episode. Today, we want to take stock of Asia, particularly emerging Asia around Singapore and ASEAN countries. And for that, I've invited someone who I have known and admired for a long time. Manu Bhaskaran is a leading Asian economist based in Singapore with more than 30 years of experience in studying economic, political, and security issues that shape the business environment in this part of the world. He coordinates the Asian business of Washington, D.C.-based strategic advisory firm Centennial Group. He works extensively with investment institutions, government agencies, and corporations. Manu was recently appointed as a member of the Regional Advisory Group for Asia-Pacific of the International Monetary Fund. He's also an adjunct senior research fellow at the Institute of Policy Studies. Manu, great to have you on Kopi Time. Thank you, Taimo. Thank you for the kind introduction. Pleasure, pleasure. Uh, Manu, let's start with Singapore. Uh, sure. We have all seen in the latest data and from forecast of the private and the official sector, the unprecedented headwinds facing the economy. Yeah. We've also seen unprecedented policy measures. So yes. please walk us through your assessment as well as prognosis. Essentially, Singapore is a global business hub and our role in life is to manage flows flows of goods, of services, of capital, of people. And all these flows have been disrupted as a result of uh, the spread of the disease and all the responses in terms of public health measures to contain the disease. So uh, clearly, our forward-facing, um, outward-facing economy suffers inevitably as a result. In addition, of course, we've got our own public health uh, crisis, which we have had to manage unfortunately, with a fairly severe lockdown. And that has crimped uh, domestic activities as well. So wherever you look, uh, whether it is domestic, whether it is uh, our global hub, whether it is construction, the economy is taking a very severe hit, as we saw with the retail sales figures that came out for March, which are down about 13%, but certainly April is going to show an even more uh, drastic reduction. So <clears throat> it is the nature of our economy all the engines of growth are affected and we should get ready for a very severe downturn, probably low double digit <clears throat> figure contraction in GDP in the second quarter before we see some steadying perhaps <clears throat> in the third quarter and fourth quarters. Manu, the uh, damage of course is uh, clear. Uh, if you lock an economy down, this term right. for that in Singapore is a circuit breaker. Uh, of course, a lot of activities get suspended. Uh, do you feel that between manufacturing and services, which one will get the biggest hit in the near term and which one also has the chance to come back relatively quickly? Yeah, very interesting question. I think <clears throat> clearly um, services activities of all kinds are going to take a big hit because they involve a lot of uh, face-to-face, uh, consumer-facing uh, interactions among people, right? So clearly our tourist-related uh, services have been walloped, uh, accommodation, food, beverage, uh, recreation, and so on. Um, <clears throat> of course, within that, financial services uh, could be uh, less affected, but uh, a lot of that is dominated by bank lending and related activities, which are clearly uh, going to take a hit as well. So I think services will uh, take proportionately a greater hit than manufacturing. Uh, some of the data in manufacturing was pointing to some degree of resilience in um, our manufacturing, primarily because of the biomedical side, but I'm not confident that that can be maintained. But nevertheless, I think the trend is clear. Services will probably do worse than uh, manufacturing. We've seen some indication of uh, bottoming out of demand in China, and certainly on the supply side, they're clearly back in business. We are still not clear how bad the demand side, the external demand side. But would China reopening have some sort of a galvanizing impact on Singapore's manufacturing and shipment? Certainly. Uh, I mean, China now is, uh, you know, 16% or more of the world economy. It's about 10, uh, 10 11% of global imports. It has a, an outsized effect on commodity prices, which our region uh, is very much driven by. Uh, so in many ways, China is very important compared to the uh, global financial crisis even just 12 years ago. Um, I think the biggest effect that China 
if we can pull off a faster than expected recovery, which is actually our baseline scenario, if we can provide that pleasant surprise, then I think global business confidence could um, <clears throat> stabilize, and that should also help us. Uh, in addition to, of course, the fact that, um, as we found in the latest uh, MAS uh, macroeconomic review, a much larger uh, dependence on this uh, on China uh, for the Singapore economy than on the US compared to, say, 10 years ago. So I think China is likely to be a positive for not just the world economy, but for us. Um, on that score, I'd like to uh, make this point. In, you know, people have been generally very cautious in the expectation of how quickly an economy can come out of uh, such a severe, precipitous decline. But if you look at China, it's quite interesting when the Beijing municipal authorities announced just a couple of days ago <clears throat> a relaxation of uh, all kinds of restrictions. Within hours, you know, air tickets, train tickets, tour group uh, bookings, all these just went through the roof. Uh, you know, the pent-up demand that was released and the rapidity with which that happened was quite extraordinary. And I think that what that told me is that consumer psychology, at least in China, has not been permanently damaged, has not been severely dented. And therefore, the demand can actually come back fairly quickly, despite uh, the bad news we've heard about the um, impact on employment and confidence and so on. And I thought that was quite telling because just about six weeks prior to that, we had surveys suggesting that when the crisis was over, Chinese consumers would, uh, would not be spending a lot and that they would be trying to rebuild their savings buffers. But the actual outcome, at least going by what's happened in the last few days, seems to suggest that consumer psychology is actually very resilient. And I think that's quite an interesting point. No, indeed. In fact, uh, it's funny, uh, you, you mentioned that I have seen some published research, even around the 1918 influenza episode, oh. that uh, while there were a lot of public policy failures uh, and mm -hmm. the pandemic was not, of course, managed because the information was not as good as we what we have today. And That's even right. there, there were uh, isolated instances where the economy did mount a V-shaped recovery the moment people felt confident to come out. Uh, so let, let's hope that, you know, that could be one source of yes. positive surprise because that's yes. clearly not being baked into the markets. Yes. We will come back and talk in much greater detail about China a little later. Yes. Uh, Manu, with staying on in Singapore, in terms of the policy response, we have seen mm -hmm. unprecedented monetary and fiscal response from the authorities. How would you uh, characterize uh, the impact of those measures on the economy going forward? I think we've uh, really had uh, three sets of measures. Uh, we've had the monetary easing, which has been actually quite uh, substantial uh, compared to uh, historical experience and rapid and done in a way that has actually, uh, I think, boosted confidence in, in the way the central bank uh, operates. On the fiscal side, we've had three budgets of uh, mounting uh, fiscal impact, and um, these have involved substantial uh, amounts of fiscal impulse. The third set of measures is uh, really the, the set of unconventional measures, as I call them, where we've had substantial wage subsidies, we've, uh, which you know, rarely happens in Singapore. We've had um, um, a renewal of the kind of uh, risk-sharing schemes that we had during the global financial crisis to maintain the flow of credit to small, medium-sized enterprises. We've had Tomasek coming out uh, very boldly with a large, uh, with great support for SIA's uh, rights issue. I think that's very important because this, what they're trying to do in policy is first, <clears throat> um, the obvious one of uh, alleviating the immediate suffering of vulnerable segments of our population. That's more of a welfare thing, but it's very, very important that we do it. The second thing we want to do is to uh, prevent uh, the shock that we've had being amplified through the system. And typically, shock amplification occurs when you have <clears throat> large-scale layoffs, hence the importance of all these job support schemes and so on. And they happen when uh, credit flows um, that the uh, corporate sector, particularly the small, medium-sized guys, need are uh, dislocated in some form. Um, so I think the measures put in place, uh, both fiscal and monetary, as well as the unconventional ones, uh, do address uh, the second objective of policy as well. The third objective of policy is to preserve production capacity for the future so that when demand comes back, um, you have uh, a manufacturing sector, a services sector, and so on that can <clears throat> very rapidly um, restart production 
and meet the new demand. Um, and so that's why things like uh, preserving Singapore Airlines so that the airline industry can pick up the slack and uh, come back uh, are, are very important. So I think when you look at it in terms of what policy should be achieving, then I would argue that the sets of measures that we have brought in, uh, sh I, I think, are well designed and I believe will do as much as it is possible in such a situation to mitigate the effect of the virus. No, Manu, I, I concur with you in terms of the wisdom behind protecting jobs, because I think repeated studies of business cycles have shown that if you allow businesses to fire a lot of people, yeah. the recovery will be asymmetric because the cost of rehiring is substantial and it takes, uh, it causes a much more of a protracted recovery. Yes. Um, so, uh, Manu, uh, in the context of Singapore, later on, I'll ask you to do some crystal ball gazing because you alluded to maintaining capacity so that when demand comes back, I'm going to ask you later, when will demand come back? <laughs> and, uh, we'll, we'll get to that in a yeah. little later. For now, maybe beyond Singapore, I'd like to think about our broader neighborhood in the ASEAN region. Uh, it's, it's, of course, a very heterogeneous region. We have wide income disparities, uh, varied vulnerabilities. Malaysia is highly exposed to the collapse in oil price and demand. Thailand is hugely reliant on tourism and manufactured goods exports. Indonesia, for better or, for, or worse, is largely driven by domestic demand. So walk us through these highly varied countries and where you see um, the economic uh, dynamic and the policy response are, are in the right, right order right now. Well, um, maybe you can start with Indonesia since that's the biggest part of our region. Um, Indonesia has uh, had a difficult uh, policy dilemma. It does not have uh, the kind of social safety nets that would allow um, the vulnerable segments of the population to uh, absorb the big shock of a sudden lockdown. So the government, um, uh, you know, for understandable reasons, was hesitant to impose the kind of lockdown, uh, stringent restrictions on social mingling that were needed to control the virus. Um, but over time, and it, uh, not just the central government, but the uh, provincial governments have sort of put in place a large number of lockdowns. And so domestic activities will inevitably slow. We saw a bit of that already evident in the GDP data that came out uh, today. Uh, so clearly March was already showing damage from these measures. Uh, clearly the second quarter is going to be a lot worse. Having said that, both in India and Indonesia, it does look like the spread of the infection has not been as severe as many people had expected. <clears throat> we don't know the reason for this, and there may well be a future acceleration in the infection rate. But as of now, and this is not just based on uh, official data, which some people uh, tend to uh, underplay, <clears throat> it's even based on independent uh, research into burials and cremations and the like. And it does look as if the spread of the virus is not as dislocating in terms of the public health impact uh, in Indonesia as one had feared. Um, so in a way, Indonesia might be lucky for whatever reasons. There are various hypotheses for this. It could be the, the type of BCG vaccine used in, in Indonesia to combat uh, tuberculosis, um, or it could be uh, the demographics. We don't know, but the fact is that the infection is not um, uh, deteriorating as uh, worrisomely as we had feared. So I think Indonesia can probably, with a bit of luck, still eke out a small amount of growth uh, year on year for the whole year, uh, but it will be minuscule, I suspect. Uh, Malaysia <clears throat> is highly exposed, as you said, uh, absolutely correct. I mean, highly exposed to oil, highly exposed to tourism, highly exposed to global demand for manufactured goods and also to other commodities uh, uh, such as palm oil, whose prices have been under pressure for some time until recently there was a bit of a recovery. So <clears throat> Malaysia has had a very difficult uh, challenge. And of course, on top of everything else, it also had um, a political crisis and a new government that took the office right smack in the middle of this uh, horrible crisis. Despite that, again, Malaysia seems to have managed it Quite well, and I think it's a reflection of the competence of the health ministry and certain uh, public health officials in particular who've managed to overcome the hurdles and put in place a sufficient uh, 
mitigating uh, policies to um, contain the worst effects. The risks are still there. Um, the government, uh, in response to public clamor, you know, it is fasting month and all that, uh, has uh, agreed to ease the restrictions on social mingling somewhat earlier than um, uh, people had hoped. Um, and that is raising some fears of a second wave of infections. But so far, I think Malaysia has done as much as it could. Its policy response has also been very, very sizable, uh, involving not just uh, fiscal, but also a lot of unconventional uh, policies. And um, so I think Malaysia, because it is so exposed to, unfortunately, the wrong things, clearly it's going to contract uh, this year, probably not as bad as uh, Singapore or Hong Kong, and probably better than uh, Thailand, but it will see a contraction this year before rebounding next year. Thailand has been very unlucky. <clears throat> it has been hit hard by this COVID-19 crisis, which has affected global demand, but it has also eviscerated tourism. And tourism is, you know, in value-added terms, probably 11 12% of uh, Thai GDP. And unfortunately, a lot of that tourism is from China, which has disappeared almost completely. So it's been extremely difficult uh, COVID crisis for Thailand, proportionately compared to other countries. But on top of that, Thailand also has um, has had to endure the worst drought in, in 60 years. And that is also a big problem for a country that has a, a large um, agricultural export sector and where uh, a significant part of manufacturing capacity is actually for food processing, agricultural processing. So <clears throat> that is another hit. And the third issue is that while the um, government has come out with, I think, a very well-designed, very well-planned uh, uh, fiscal stimulus, uh, somehow the disbursement uh, rate, the implementation rate of those uh, initiatives has been uh, a bit slower than we had hoped for. So putting it all together, I think Thailand probably <clears throat> will see a fairly severe contraction, perhaps even as bad as 7% uh, for the year as a whole. Yeah, that's actually exactly in line with uh, what our forecasts uh, have. <laughs> there you are. Right <laughs> Great minds. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, Manu, on Malaysia, just a follow-up issue. The fiscal authorities almost 20% of their revenues are, are directly linked to oil and gas related activities, the dividends from the large uh, state-owned enterprises and so on. And that, of course, will be affected deeply this year. But counter that with the point that you made, that they have actually had a very generous, uh, I, I would say by all measures, probably the most generous uh, fiscal package that we have seen in the region when you add up all the on-balance and off-balance sheet yeah. stimulus measures. Doesn't this raise a substantial risk of, uh, with respect to Malaysia's sovereign debt? I mean, clearly the public debt to GDP ratio, which has a ceiling of 55% mandated, um, they will probably have to go to parliament and, and um, ask for some forbearance on that. Um, I think, you know, obviously something has to give in a crisis like this. And the least bad option, I think, is to allow the public sector debt um, to, to, to rise. And even if it goes to, say, 60%, uh, let's face it, I mean, that is still hugely better than most uh, developed countries. and. Um, uh, I mean, to be fair to Malaysia, if you look at its uh, fiscal management since the mid-1990s, it has been actually very, very good. Um, <clears throat> I think it also suggests that, um, if I may say so, I think it probably was, uh, with the benefit of some hindsight, it probably was a, a misjudgment to have abolished uh, the GST completely in uh, 2018 when the new government uh, took over. Um, so the new government probably has the political challenge of finding some way of uh, reconstituting uh, the GST. Because as you and I know, um, there is no better, more efficient means of uh, raising revenue um, in a you know uh, least damaging way than the GST. So some way will have to be found of uh, bringing that back so that over time, um, <clears throat> the revenue situation can uh, improve and help uh, uh, strengthen Malaysia's fiscal position again. And also if that is done, the rating agencies, I think, will probably feel a bit more uh, confident about Malaysia. Right. Um, Manu, one thing that I worry about ASEAN in general is that, you know, while in recent years the rhetoric has been toward more trade uh, uh, integration and more opening up yes. the economy, uh, 
But crises like this have ways of making people become more inward looking. And we do have some large rice exporters in the region from Vietnam to Myanmar, even Thailand. Actually, even India is an exporter of rice. Do you worry, especially with the drought situation in Thailand and now all this COVID-related uncertainty, that we might see an element of hoarding of food, which may cause some consternation in the global market for food? Actually, Temu, you're absolutely right. And this is something that we have been um, worried about and have written about. I think um, uh, food security, food price inflation, clearly an issue. Uh, the, what I'm relieved by is that the initial uh, instinctive reaction in, in Vietnam, Cambodia to put restrictions on exports, I think uh, th- those thankfully have been uh, reversed. Um, <clears throat> so I hope that uh, um, the good old ASEAN uh, solidarity thing has prevailed and uh, uh, the rice exporting nations have realized that uh, uh, <clears throat> it is far better from a longer term perspective to try and work together. Uh, rather than impose, um, um, you know, uh, individual responses like the uh, export restrictions. So I am a bit concerned about that, but uh, hopefully uh, the worst of that particular concern has uh, has passed. There is a, yes, a lot. Please? Sure, uh, there's a lot of lament about lack of global leadership in terms of coordination between nations in dealing with this crisis. What are we seeing among ASEAN leaders? Are they talking regularly? Are they coordinating a little bit? Well, uh, to be honest, um, I have not been holding my breath exactly to see a you know, robust uh, ASEAN-wide uh, response. Uh, I'm sure, in fact, they, I mean, it, it's been reported that the leaders have had uh, online discussions and so on. Um, but, uh, you know, ASEAN is by its nature, a uh, consensus-based uh, 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 10-nation uh, body. <clears throat> it's not the European Union, uh, which has progressed much further um, in terms of uh, you know, fairly rigorous forms of integration. So um, I, I think you know, it's probably asking too much of the kind of ASEAN structure that we have today to expect um, an EU kind of uh, response, and you know, even the EU has uh, frankly struggled in, in responding, right? So, um, uh, unfortunately, it you know, in terms of policy response, you know, ninety nine percent of it has to come from the individual countries. Um, I wish that ASEAN was stronger, but the reality is that it is not, and so it is really up to the individual countries to to do something about that. But I do hope that <clears throat> this crisis. In combination with the, um, you know, unfortunate trends in, uh, in in world trade and so on, will persuade ASEAN countries that uh, they really have to move much faster on ASEAN integration, even if it means pooling sovereignty to a larger extent than they have been willing to do in the past. Please, Manu, in terms of pooling um, resources beyond sovereignty, one hope was that the legacy of 97 crisis as well as the 2007-8 crisis would be a emboldened Chiang Mai Plus 3 initiative yes. which ASEAN countries will be able to take care of their external funding needs by tapping to their own reserve pool. Yes. What happened to that? Well, um, you know, the Chiang Mai initiative has been multilateralized. It has been expanded. And, you know, there is gradual progress. Um, I think the establishment of the ASEAN Plus 3 Macroeconomic Research Office has been a a, a sizable improvement in the capacity of the CMIM uh, initiative because by giving uh, an independent surveillance capacity to that uh, initiative, it, uh, it gives the donor countries, basically China, Japan, and Korea, greater confidence uh, that any money that they help to fund, a- any loan disbursements and uh, monetary support uh, will eventually be paid back. <clears throat> um, I think late last year, there was a further expansion of the surveillance capacity. And I understand that the large donor countries were very happy with that. And that makes for an initiative that will work better. So I suspect that <clears throat> uh, compared to 2008, 2009, when uh, countries in the region hesitated uh, about uh, you know, resorting to the CMI initiative. 
I think if there is another wave of financial market turbulence and one or two countries need support, I think they'll be more willing to consider CMIM than 10 years ago. So there's been some improvement there, but we still have a long way to go. To me, the fundamental issue here is that CMIM is not just an ASEAN uh, initiative, it is ASEAN plus three, and um, <clears throat> ASEAN has basically um, uh, structured it in such a way that the uh, uh, dominant um, amount of money really comes from the non-ASEAN countries. I think it is time that ASEAN uh, you know, expanded its own um, uh, multilateral initiative in this regard so that it does not depend on China, Japan or Korea uh, in that uh, crisis. Right. So speaking of dependency, I mean, you have taken us seamlessly into the discussion on China because one yes. thing that has gotten to the way of ASEAN's consensus-based agreements in recent years has been uh, the uh, looming presence of China uh, and, and its uh, views being reflected through certain ASEAN members' uh, uh, views. Um, yes. Now, we are living in rather strange times. I mean, we thought that we had seen the worst of U.S.-China antagonism last year in yes. the trade war. That looks quaint compared to what I'm afraid is coming, yes. uh, this whole pandemic um, backlash that is coming. Uh, do you worry that this could prolong the global slowdown and hit consumer confidence and investment confidence? And also, how will ASEAN play itself in this whole China-US fight? I think these are very big and very, very important questions. I mean, on my baseline scenario, <clears throat> I have assumed that <clears throat> the geopolitical tensions that uh, may arise will be episodic and uh, managed down. In other words, I expect some uh, incidents and some episodes of stress, <clears throat> but none so serious or prolonged as to disrupt the recovery that I see coming. But it is clearly a big risk factor. Um, and, and this goes beyond um, what some people fear is that, oh, well, you know, it's the election silly season in America and... Uh, it serves certain political parties' interests to uh, beat up uh, on, on China. But once the election is over, all this will pass. No, I think this is much more fundamental, much more fundamental. And it really revolves around <clears throat> um, the two big powers positioning in uh, the Western Pacific. And I think they are fundamental uh, clash of interests. Uh, China, for its own security, and if you look at uh, China's geography and its strategic position, you can understand why it is finding it increasingly intolerant to uh, countenance a strong U.S. military position in the West Pacific. But for the United States, uh, don't forget, as soon as the United States extended its geographical reach to the Pacific coast um, in the 1840s, within 10 years of that, uh, the U.S. sent a naval uh, operation to uh, Tokyo and forced open the, to uh, the Japanese uh, market, right? Uh, in other words, for more than 170 years, through even through a period when the U.S. was not economically dominant, the U.S. has had a fundamental interest in the affairs of the Western Pacific, and it will not go away. So there's a fundamental clash of interests, and that is bound to lead to um, incidents of stress. If on top of that, you have a Hong Kong uh, dip, uh, domestic uh, political situation, which could potentially uh, uh, surge again in terms of protests. If you have a Taiwan situation where uh, China is increasingly uh, putting pressure on Taiwan, find ways to reunify. And on top of all this, you have a situation in the South China Sea where <clears throat> um, Chinese uh, fishing vessels uh, operating in disputed waters, those kinds of incidents continue to proliferate. Then you have a situation where you could get a small accident that could be mismanaged and then it becomes a big incident. So unfortunately, ASEAN has to understand that it is operating in a decidedly more hostile environment and that we need to put forward a coherent and united uh, front if we are to manage uh, this much more difficult situation. Right. Um, it, difficult indeed. Uh, and especially if the U.S., um, independent of, you know, whether Donald Trump gets reelected or not, I fully agree with you. I think that this is beyond just presidential election politics and is here to stay and quite bipartisan, in fact. 
Um, mm. and, and if the pressures do ratchet up, mm. uh, the risk is on one hand, ASEAN countries will have to choose, which I am quite certain that maybe barring Cambodia, not a single ASEAN country mm. wants to or is in a position to choose between China yeah. and the US. Uh, and also uh, they have their own electorate to consider. So whether yes. it's the authority mm. in the Philippines or Vietnam, um, kowtowing to China would not be seen as a popular thing at all. Yes. Um, Manu, coming back to the issue of stress in the region, um, as you uh, talked about the Chiang Mai Plus 3 initiative, uh, we've also seen in the last two months the U.S. Fed coming and offering bilateral swaps to emerging market economies yes. in multiple waves. And now I can, I think we can all say safely that that issue for the time being has been taken care of. We also have a very energetic IMF coming around the world and, and offering um, a part of its war chest. Every day I get an email saying this mm -hmm. country in Africa and that country in Africa is getting another program for the IMF. Um, right. But by and large, it seems to me within ASEAN, even six, 12 months from now, even if the recoveries were not robust, we will not mm -hmm. see anybody resorting to that extreme, going to the IMF for a program. Right now, it doesn't look like it. I mean, um, <clears throat> don't forget, we've gone through an extraordinary period of stress where the <clears throat> outflows um, from equity and bond markets in Indonesia and Malaysia and so on have been on a scale that was, uh, I think, more than double what we saw happen in the global financial crisis. And that was based right. over a much longer period. So our systems have been stressed and have proven to be fairly resilient. Yes, you did get a material uh, currency adjustment, but the economy seemed to have adjusted to that. You don't see a loss of confidence. You don't see people panicking and moving money out of local banks, foreign banks, and out of any bank in the country to uh, 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 you know, Hong Kong or Singapore. You know These things you saw in 2008, uh, you, you are not seeing it uh, today. And that suggests that <clears throat> more fundamental improvements have uh, you know, been evolving in the region, uh, greater confidence in cent central banks. Uh, in the central banks have demonstrated a much better management of inflation, inflation expectations, and of supervising the financial sectors. And uh, the resulting um, strengthening of, of confidence, uh, I think, has uh, enabled us to be more resilient this time. So it would take, I suspect, a much, much more severe shock of some kind. Say there's a, 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 another major financial shock in, in the U.S. or something which we never anticipated, something that comes uh, on a scale like that would be needed for uh, the, the financial distress in this part of the world to become so serious. Oh, I agree. If we do an analysis of all emerging market countries and rank them in terms of fiscal soundness and financial soundness, I don't think any of the countries in our neighborhood would be in the top 10, whereas many countries in Latin America plus yes. uh, emerging Africa and emerging Europe would populate that list quite readily. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, right. Um, Manu, on the more structural side of the issue, um, mm -hmm. the anti-China backlash, notwithstanding, we have seen a decade-long uh, move where as China becomes more expensive and as ASEAN shows sign of catching up to some extent, but still characterized by cheap labor, uh, and a young population, there has been some movement of the supply chain away from China. And today, because of the political sensitivities, it makes sense for global multinationals to diversify their supply chain anyway. Yes. Would ASEAN benefit from that? Or have we reached a point where there will be more home bias and that uh, uh, realignment of the supply chain would mean it doesn't really come to ASEAN? Yeah, I think, uh, <clears throat> you know, this is going to be one of the big um, uh, trends, right? Uh, in the next few years. And you're right, it started earlier. It started because China was moving out the value chain and uh, it actually suited China's economic development to move the low value uh, stuff out as, you know, Japan, Korea, Taiwan and, and Singapore and all that did in the past. Then the second wave was caused by the rise in protectionism, uh, <clears throat> which I think spurred that uh, relocation even more. And now you have uh, uh, this big shock, right? And I think it's going to be quite complex. It already was complex to begin with because what you were seeing, even the first two phases of uh, reconfigurating supply chains was uh, first, some of the <clears throat> the activities were uh, 
being reshored already, right? That uh, other technological changes, um, you know, advances in um, in manufacturing technologies and all that were making uh, uh, some of the activities actually again competitive, even in a developed economy setting. So you were getting some degree of reshoring of, of stuff going back to uh, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and the United States. Um, I think that reshoring might accelerate somewhat because I think in areas like antibiotics and ventilators and you know biomedical equipment of that kind, I think there's a greater uh, sense that um, there has to be a much higher degree of self-sufficiency for public health uh, reasons. So I think in those areas, you could see more reshoring rather than continued outsourcing to a <clears throat> cheaper location. Um, you also saw a lot of nearshoring. Right? In other words, <clears throat> um, where, where stuff had to move out of China, the multinational company decided that it would be better to move um, the production to a developing country that bordered or was very closely, geographically close to the developed market. So this benefited Mexico and Turkey and uh, Central Eastern Europe rather than Southeast Asia. It was quite small, but you did see that dimension of this reconfiguration. And the rest of it was outsourcing. And uh, the bulk of that outsourcing, the continued outsourcing, uh, was flowing to Southeast Asia and maybe uh, Bangladesh. Uh, not so much to Indonesia and India, but uh, certainly Vietnam, Cambodia, Bangladesh, Thailand, and, and Malaysia benefited significantly. Um, I think as we get into this new phase, once we recover and once we reach a new norm, new steady state in the world economy, I suspect we will continue to see, um, <clears throat> in fact, uh, we will see a faster pace of uh, reconfiguring supply chains. And I think in many cases, it will still make sense for that relocation to move to countries like Vietnam, like Thailand, like Malaysia. Right, indeed. Uh, but uh, in, in terms of the immediate uh, aftermath of the COVID-19, um, do you see, and, and this sort of takes me back to your earlier point about the need to maintain capacity so that when demand comes back, you can be ready to take advantage of that. Yes. Um, will the demand come back in the next six to 12 months if we are going to run on 50% capacity in restaurants? Yeah, so, you know, this is the complex question, right? Um, you know, one part of me says that we shouldn't be too uh, pessimistic. I think there will be there'll be many sectors, different sectors, and the experiences in these sectors will differ. If you're talking about air travel, if you're talking about restaurants, you know, food and beverage related stuff, you're talking about mass recreational events, big sporting events, big concerts, for sure. <clears throat> you know, social distancing will have to be maintained. And even, I can tell you that, even if the governments uh, uh, do not impose regulations, I think people on their own volition will be much more careful. So those sectors <clears throat> uh, clearly will take a much longer time before they reach the pre-crisis level of activity. Uh, but even there, you know, this is human nature. People like to travel. People like to congregate. Uh, ways will be found to achieve the public health uh, uh, <clears throat> conditions uh, while allowing people to go back to their normal activities. I think um, you know we should not underestimate this human desire to to have a normal activity, to have a normal life, to engage with people, and so on. Uh, but yes, I, I, I definitely concede it's going to take longer in those particular sectors. There will be other sectors where <clears throat> the um, disruption of demand will be quite short-lived. Uh, so my sense is that as long as production capacity is preserved, as long as the basic demand drivers, i.e. jobs, incomes, and uh, continued fiscal support are there, then I think typically, uh, you know, overall, I think consumer demand and investment demand can eventually come back. And that, um, you know, the, the, in other words, I don't see reasons to believe that the there would be a permanent damage to um, demand, uh, what the economist calls the 90% economy. I think that's probably a little bit too pessimistic a read on what to expect. Certainly in the initial recovery from the COVID crisis, the first 
two to three quarters, yes, I think it will be a 90% economy. But beyond that, do not underestimate uh, what can be done in terms of policy, in terms of public health um, <clears throat> uh, progress and so on to return us to a 100% economy. Indeed. And I think that the the proponents of the dire scenario, I think, have a very Western-centric perspective, which is that the Western yes. world is so saddled with debt that yes. this is going to make a debt situation, which was bad, much yes. worse. And therefore, many years will go by just through the deleveraging process. Yes. Exactly. Uh, thankfully, as a large surplus region, ASEAN does not have to go through you know painful deleveraging. That was done 20 years ago. That's and right. We learned uh, to a large extent. Manu, uh, this probably is as optimistic a note we can probably conclude <laughs> our discussion. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's been great to have you here. And thanks to you, our listeners, for your time as well. You can find all our publications and multimedia by Googling DBS Research Library. Bye-bye.